Thanks, everybody, for coming, for sticking around till 4 o'clock. This was supposed to be at 11, I was told, before I came, and I was all ready to go home, and then they told me it was at 4, and I was like, okay, I'll stay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, really very grateful for you all to come here. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'll start... Um, so I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of the land that we're on, that we're on today. We're on the Nipmuc, ancestral territories of the Nipmuc Nation. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of the land and the people whose land we're on. There's been 400 years of settler colonialism on this country and this continent that has really tried to distance ourselves, us, from the, the true history of the land. So in spaces, and especially in spaces that are going to places around social justice work and conversation, really try and center and always remember the land that we're on and the original stewards of this land. So sending an honor and a, a blessing and gratitude to the original stewards of this land and those that continue to steward this land. I'll just tell a little bit about myself and what brought me here so that there's some context. But I've been part of the BFA, the Bionutrient Food Association, for about 10 years. I grew up in Westchester County, which is on Lenape land, and I uh, was a farmer. I came into agriculture as really with like a heart toward healing. I saw that there's a, where I live, it's a very suburban, urban area where there's a lot of just stuff happening, you know, and I knew that I had to go back there in order to like bring what I was doing around agriculture, around growing food and helping to share, teaching people about growing food. I got, I met Dan Kittredge very, when I was young, I was, I think, 23, 24, and I just, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have been in the same situation. You go to one of his talks, and there was just something that happened that really, like, brought a lot of things together, that what I was seeking to do around healing kind of our relationships with people, like, that really starts with healing the relationship with, with Mama Earth and the, and the soil and the land that we all grow from. So I've been part of this community for at least nine years now. This is my ninth conference. And every, every year, you know, I come here and just learn so much and I'm so grateful and filled with gratitude for all of the, the knowledge that is shared and so openly and all of the love that is really held in this space. But I've also really felt that there's not a lot of people that are here um, that there's, you know, that the, the folks that do come to this are coming from, you know, very, through specific networks, you know, that this information and knowledge is shared. You know, as you probably can tell, like, the, it's a very white space. The gender imbalances are, you know, there's, it used to be a lot more men than, than women that were at these spaces. And this knowledge, this wisdom that is, is held here is so important for transformation in the world and transformation in our food system. And in order for that change to really happen on a big scale, like everybody, you know, everybody needs to be part of this conversation. And I think upon my own reflections and things on how I am in spaces and, and kind of take up spaces, you know, I... I I feel like what I need to do as, as a white person, as a person of settler descent on this con continent, is also to have these conversations around building equity and building in um, inclusivity and diversity and redistributing power as it's held within these spaces. Because as I said, like this knowledge and information is so precious and important, but um, there's only so many people that are here. And so how do we create a culture that is also doing this transformative work in the food system um, with land and soil, but that also that we're recognizing that there are certain imbalances in, in how and who is present in these spaces. Um, so this is my attempt, my first attempt, to have a conversation, really to open a dialogue f for us to have. And you know, moving forward in how do we build equity into not just the BFA, but also the good food movement and the regenerative food movement. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about equity, but for me, this all really starts with the land, and it starts by um, acknowledging the land that we're on, acknowledging my own privileges, acknowledging my own advantages that I have. I am a white person um, and a person of settler descent, so my ancestors came to this continent from Europe 
from Western Europe, France, in England, and Scotland, and then my other side from Southern Italy came to this land. Some of my mother's side was some of the first settlers on this, on this continent um, 500, 400 years ago. Um, my father's side came in the 1920s. So I have two very different stories of how um, my family has become white on this land. So that has been really informative in trying to understand a little bit more of the history of this kind of white male dominant system. So I do personally hold that advantage of being a white person of settler descent, um, recognizing my, that advantage. I also am male presenting. I'm a man um, in a male supremacist society. I have the advantage of being male, male presenting. Um, though I am queer, I do present as cis and straight. You know, I've moved through my whole life as, as that, and so I've held those advantages of, you know, being heterosexual in a very heterosexual dominant um, society. I'm able-bodied. I have full use of my, you know, my limbs, my body. You know, I do have a very occasional mental illness, you know, but I'm sure many of us do. But I do, I'm able to work, I'm able to use my body, and so I'm not discriminated against for being disabled. I am of Christian orientation. I was brought up Christian. I, I don't go to church, but um, I am of that kind of oriented religion. And so all of, I'm, I'm saying all of these things because we live in a society that really kind of focuses on supporting the white, male, cisgendered, able-bodied, Christian-oriented person. From the very beginning of this country, it's been really formatted to, to serve the people that meet those needs while systematically disadvantaging um, those of other spaces and identities within that. I, I personally feel like it's a, a part of the work to be recognizing these advantages and disadvantages and privileges so that we can kind of embody and, and know that how, personally, how I have embodied like the supremacist culture that is really surrounding. You know, I've moved, I, I, I didn't build the house, but like I definitely live in it. And I've lived with it my whole life and I've assumed the benefits and the privileges of, that ident of these identities. So what I would like to start as a little practice is just introductions with all of us, and, and I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here, but I think we can move through this kind of quick. And I, I do this not just so that we can all meet each other. Um, I feel like relationship is also how we will build a movement toward building equity, is that we know each other, that we are familiar, that we have relationships with each other. So I would like for all of us to kind of just share a little bit about ourselves, if, if that's OK. If you feel comfortable, just going around the room and, and sharing your name, your gender pronoun, where you live. Um, if you know whose land you're on, um, with the indigeneity of the land that you're on, the um, your uh, racial identity, class background, and other identities. I didn't mention class, but obviously class has a very big role to play in, um, in, in this society. And so I was raised middle, middle class. And we mentioned that because of that the patriarchy and the, the white supremacy culture is very ingrained and imbibed into the capitalist economy system. And so if we don't recognize that as a foundation of kind of the disrupts, disruptions that happen from that, we're not really getting anywhere. Um, so part of that is like an identifying that there is class, there is these separations and exploitations of, lower, of the poor and working class in the society as well. So if we can share those really quick. Part of how the culture works is like keeping us silent. And, and I don't know about you all, but I've carried a lot of shame through my whole life around being a, a white person, around being male, and really seeing how the, these cultures of male supremacy and white supremacy play out. And that I've obviously benefited from them. But I've stayed silent most of my life because I haven't known how to talk about it. And this is part of my learning how to talk about it and practicing, but like how it's manifested for me is a lot of shame around these things that I've benefited from that other people have been hurt from. And that's kept me silent. Um, and silence in this day um, perpetuates the violence that happens. And so I feel like when we can say, you know, I'm white, 
you know, that's something because whiteness is not often recognized as a race. When we talk about race and racism, it's a, often a conversation that is directed towards people of color. And we don't talk about whites, but whiteness, but whiteness is the foundation of racism. It is a construct. I'm not going to go into too much, but if we don't talk about whiteness, we don't talk about the foundations of racism. And so just saying white, saying that I am white is recognizing that, yes, white is a race, um, which is actually pretty powerful because not, as white folks, I'm not, as a white person, I'm not really taught that I exist. I'm taught that whiteness is the norm almost. And that is really dangerous in the, in the, in the big thing where, so we can kind of move through that. So is that okay if we kind of go around quickly and just share what you're comfortable sharing and then we'll get moving on some of the other things? Thank you all so much. I appreciate that. So the workshop's called Healing in the Food System, Building Equity to Increase Quality. And increasing quality in the food supply is the Bionutrient Food Association's mission. I think that's why we're probably all here, is to help support that in some way. Um, how do we increase the quality of the food supply? And I, this, this workshop is around my, my feeling that to ultimately get to that place where we can do that healing work of increasing quality, we do have to build and redistribute power within the food movement, something that this is a, a food system that impacts all people, and so all people need to have a role in transforming this food system from one that is not serving the needs of humanity to one that that is serving the needs of humanity. Um, and for that to be self-determined by all people, by, by the communities that are most impacted by this food system. So part of what I, we're going to do um, today is just go through a brief history of kind of how we've gotten to where we are today. Because, well, increasing quality to me implies a healing, that we're healing from something. Right? If we didn't have to, if we were good, we wouldn't have to increase quality in the first place, right? Like if everything was okay, we'd, we wouldn't have to be talking, using that language. But to me, that implies that there's healing to do, right? That there's something that has caused an imbalance, that has caused our food supply to be in a not so well state that we need to increase from. Um, and so I wanna have a conversation a little bit about navigating maybe why and how we've gotten to that place that um, our food is not containing this, the nutrients that we need to grow and live flourishing lives. And then we'll end with a little, with an exercise on what we can do to help to build a, a collectively in solidarity a system that is meeting the needs of people and what we can do in our home places. I'm gonna go through a series of photos and really I just wanna call from y'all just what, what they bring up and then we can have more of a conversation. So it's not me speaking, but I think we, we all have so much knowledge and sharing in our, inside of ourselves. Um, and I really just want to make a space for all of that wisdom to come up um, rather than me try and teach something, which I'm sure we all know a lot together. Does anybody know what this is? The name of the painting, I guess, oh, if anybody's seen it. But it's, um, anybody know what Manifest Destiny is? It was fated that the Europeans would basically cover this continent from coast to coast and drive the native population into oblivion as they went. Manifest Destiny. Mm -hmm. So Manifest Destiny was the 19th century doctrine or belief that the expansion of the United States throughout the American continent was both justified and inevitable, and that settlers were des destined to expand across North America. So this was a very early kind of support for westward expansion and for colonization of Turtle Island of North America. It was built into the system that white Europeans had the justification to move westward and partake in the genocide of indigenous people. Does anybody know what the doctrine of discovery is? Has anybody heard that term? So the doctrine of discovery was established it was a spiritual, political, and legal justification for colonization and seizure of land not inhabited by Christians. It has been invoked since Pope Alexander VI issued the Papal Bull in 1493. So the doctrine of discovery was really what allowed the justification of people moving over the Atlantic Ocean to this continent and to 
systematically kind of overtake the indigenous people who were labeled as heathens by the Christian church. So I, I bring this up because it was the founda really foundational to how land became occupied in this country. There was this inherent belief that it was the white man's um, obligation to um, colonize the land. It's not something that ended in 1493. It's continuing. I mean, it, it was really recently upheld in the U.S. Supreme Court in, I don't think, the last two decades. So it's something that is still very real. Yeah, these ideas of private property are a European idea. They came through colonization. They came through the doctrine of discovery and the transplant of European culture on this continent. Before then, this idea of private property and capitalism did not exist on this continent, or at least on the in the colonies. The Spanish brought a lot of it early, but private property is a, is a relatively new idea here. So I know it's something that has become commonplace, but like really to think about how these things got founded and the privatization of land for white European ownership um, has been part of the creation, really, of this country um, and thus the food system that we're a part of. So this is this was how one way in, in the genocide of indigenous people has been carried along is the taking of land. All this happening, though, within the context of the kind of othering and criminalization of indigenous life ways. So the Europeans saw it as their duty also, and continue to in some ways, to occupy the land based on that idea of manifest destiny, based on that idea of doctrine of discovery. And again, early on in, this, in the colonies, about two-thirds of the Europeans that came to this continent were in servitude. Um, meaning that they were enslaved in some ways. They had sold their labor um, to work off. Um, and then once they had done their, often it was seven years, often when they had worked their seven years, they were then able to own land. Um, and that was part of the way that white ownership of land got to spread and you know the, the growth and influence of the white European colonization of this continent happened was by giving people, white people, basically free land, um, stealing it, and then giving it to white people. Um, so you're saying that they would get passage to the United States for seven years' work here? Many right? people worked in servitude. Um, Euro European, um, thank you on the name, but indentured servants. Yeah, that's indenture was the, the term for that. So rather, we're, or we'll get into enslavement and slavery. Slavery is the selling and ownership of one's body, whereas servitude and um, indenture was the sale of one's labor. So after seven years, that person was free. And in this country, many people were given land, indigenous land. Um, in New England, the practices of European agriculture were brought here. Um, parts of Europe, um, in the at least the northern colonies, the immense deforestation of land that came to build fields so that that form of agriculture that was happening in Europe could be replicated here, um, even though the land is quite different and not as acceptable to the vegetable crop production. Um, so the deforestation of land, but the ecological consequences of this that we're still working through and with today. Um, and this very much continues to impact the food system. Once the trees are gone, the minerals, the biology um, don't have those roots to hold on to anymore, right? And so to remove those trees is to remove the foundation and the lifeblood, the pho photosynthetic accumulators of life on this continent. And so once they're gone, that biology, all of those microbes don't have the the, soil, the carbon coming through the plant roots, um, and that, that land slowly degenerates. And so when we say increasing quality in the food supply, you know, it, it is part that we're increasing some of these wounds that have occurred through the colonization of this continent and the deforestation of the land. And again, I'm not saying these things to bring shame to us. You know, this is 
to know where we are, it's really important to know where we've come from so that we don't replicate the things and maintain some, some of the systems that are still in place that we can actually do a transformation and, and reimagine what a, what a new way can be. So understanding where we've come from is really important in that process. I'm just reading a book, it's called Sermons in Stone. It's about the stone walls that are built throughout New England and, and Southern New York. And one of the points that the author is making is that the stones were used because there was no wood to build fences because all of the wood, all of the trees had been cut to build ships for the, the war and um, for, for, for burning and for, so just like pretty poor forest management, you know? but an abundance of stones. This might be a little out there, but I, I do want to connect this to the food system. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? And so who was targeted during the witch hunts? Women, right? Herbalists, you know, there was this idea that that was kind of drilled into people that the women, the herbalists, especially the caretakers, the doulas, the midwives, were were dangerous, were in some way doing something that was, you know, creating conditions of, of fear within, and that was spread. And so why, why would women be targeted? Like the term witchcraft and herbal, like the way that the, um, I would say the kind of, the, the male patriarchy labeled women of the time um, for creating like these supposed crimes of, um, you know, all of the things. Like, uh, I'm 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 studying the witch trials because it's a very, very very fascinating and important time I think in this country's transition from feudalism, to, not this country, but in Europe, feudalism to capitalism, and then that transference to this continent, and how women are the carriers and protectors of life. And in order to control life, the control of women has been necessitated and thus in the control of land. So by the male dominant patriarchy, uh, white, that there is this domineering and, and there's need to maintain control of not just land, which we've seen, um, but also of those who are the holders of life and the carriers of life in order to control life. Um, and that created a, a very subjugated group of women. Um, and so like that still maintains and continues. And I think we still see the patterns of this in the good food movement, <laughs> you know, and, and across the country and all kind of movements. But, you know, that these, that these ways are still so ingrained within how, how we work in, in ways. And it's like the dismantling of these things is what we need to do in order to actually build a new system. It's like the power structure that this conveys is something that is still being held onto and that we need to dismantle. Yeah. The cr control over reproduction, really, you know, that women are the producers of life. And so um, to control that again, to control women, and another way to do that is, is through these ways of really terrifying and, you know, terror campaigns against against people that are trying to be controlled. It's a four different kind of illustrations here. Tell me what's happening in the in the top left here. So the transatlantic slave, slave trade, right, um, was a, a capturing of people from mostly West Africa to bring to the colonies. It began in 1619, almost 400 years ago. And folks were taken, this was a, a strategic um, thing. So. You know the the immigrants, the the, the uh, settlers were mostly coming from northern and western Europe, and the climate in Western Europe is very different from the climate of say the southern colonies, right? So if people weren't living and growing, like the colonists didn't know how to grow things in that hot weather, so they found the labor of people that could do that work and were specialists in that work. So, so many of the people that were captured, many of the African folks that were captured, were very, very good at growing the certain crops, rice, cotton, these things. And so their labor, as well as their bodies, was, was stolen from Africa um, and brought to the colonies in order to build the foundational wealth of, of this country. 
Um, so through chattel slavery, and again, chattel slavery being different than um, indenture and servitude, whereas indenture and servitude are sale of one's labor for a certain amount of time, um, chattel slavery was the indefinite sale and ownership of one's body. And so chattel slavery became this very new model of slavery in the Americas, where not only one person, but that, one, that person's offspring and generation after that would be in, sold into slavery. So whereas indenture is a one person, chattel slavery made it so that it was this commitment of generations to um, enslavement. And as we probably have learned and know that the, the South became the really generator of um, wealth through the northern markets of the colonies, the cotton, the um, tobacco, the other cash crops and, and plantation crops, the sugar, were sold through northern markets and, and were the, really built the foundational wealth of this country. Um, so that wealth being really built from enslaved and stolen labor and, and people. So um, again, our food system has been built on this foundation of land exploitation, of the exploitation of, of people. Chattel slavery after 1860 and the abolishment of the abolishment of prison of uh, slavery, white folks didn't weren't really weren't ready for um, the freedom and liberation of black people in this country. And so there were reconstruction was the time after the end of the Civil War um, for about 50 years, I believe. Um, reconstruction, black reconstruction, where it, was, it did see a lot of upsurge in, in um, industry and black run industry and black ownership of farms. Um, but there was also a rise in anti-black racism. And there wasn't the systemic, there wasn't the system of slavery set up anymore, but there was the on the ground kind of deep racism um, that allowed for the continued subjugation of people of African descent. Um, it's here that I just, I, I wanna ask the question what, what the difference folks know and think um, between individual bias and systemic racism, because I think that's very, very important in this conversation. So the difference between individual bias or discrimination versus systemic discrimination. Does anybody, can anybody tell me, or like what's different, yeah. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between individual bigotry and someone being a racist, someone saying racist or doing racist things from the institution of racism and white supremacy. There's a difference, I, I think, in these conversations of kind of undoing these things, a lot of people say, wait, I'm not, I'm not racist. I don't have any discrimination against other people of other races, you know. And as a white person, like, I can say that. I can say I don't see color, you know. I can kind of do that color blindness thing, you know. But I still benefit from the system of white supremacy that does give me advantages as a white person. I don't have to be a bigot. I don't have to say racist things in order to benefit from racism. So it's, it's this very like complex thing that has occurred. And, and this is a little bit of an illustration of how it went from this blatant form of racial um, subjugation to convict leasing into prisons. And so now we have a prison system that is built and set up that does overly incarcerate people of color and poor folks. But we can't say that that's racist almost, you know? Like we don't, there isn't a conversation about like a broader, com I mean, there, there is. But I think in, in certain ways that it becomes something that we don't see the structural part and the systemic, the, the power and the depth of how racism has become a part of this country and our food system. We, don't, we, we see and re reflect and react to the, the upsurges, you know, when Donald Trump says something that is explicitly racist, or there's a, you know, um, a Klan uprising, or you know, Charlottesville, we see those things, and but that's not, that's like a sub, that's a surface 
part of racism. That's an expression of it. The deeper, more impactful, like the, the heart of this is the systemic part that it's built into these systems and institutions. It's built into the justice system. It's built into the education system. It's built into the food system. Um, so it becomes a little harder to, say, to see and to recognize, but it's still very much present. And it has been. This is part of the chronology of how it's become ingrained. Anybody know what this is? The dust bowl. Well, what was dust? Topsoil. Topsoil. How much topsoil was lost? Does anybody know? Quite a lot of uh, soil was lost in the, in the high plains. So does anybody know of the Homestead Act of 1862? Anybody heard of this? Offered settlers 160 acres um, in the Great Plains area. Uh, so free land was given by the government, um, which led to a huge influx and movement of um, European settlers to the Great Plains, to this um, grassland. Uh, the Great Plains was a vi like a vibrant ecologically. It was an ecosystem of, of grasslands um, prior to the plow coming. Um, so grasslands covered 21% of the U.S. and Canada. Once this, set, you know, this movement happened, um, the plow came, the ground was tilled, turned over, um, centuries of grass and humates and roots um, was overturned, and uh, wheat was planted, among other things. And this was during the 1920s. And so during the 1920s, the, the boom, you know, in this country. And so there was a huge market for wheat, and thus the cultivation of millions of acres of the Great Plains was turned in from grass into wheat um, and other, other crops. In uh, the matter of about 15 years, so when the Great Depression came, there was this, um, a surplus of grain, but not a market to buy that grain. Um, so wheat that had been grown from these fields that had been upturned, um, so much of that wheat sat in silos and wasn't rotted um, before it could be fed to people because nobody had money um, because of the stock market crashing. So we see this dependence on money, we see this dependence on land, on commodity crops for the, econ for the building of the economy and the food system. Um, and so more than 850 million tons of topsoil were blown off the Southern Plains in 1935, um, one year. Um, that topsoil has, you know, the implications of this are still being felt. Um, the Great Plains have not fully recovered from, from this. Um, and so I, I use this as an example to see, just to illustrate what happens to a food system when it becomes more based on surplus, based on commodity markets, based on non-ecological types of farming, um, all of which were imported to this country through colonization um, and colonialism. Um, so this is, again, like the, the use of poor people to do this colonizing work, right? So the land was made free by the government and then it was the many immigrant um, people and families took that opportunity for the betterment of their, their, their selves and their family to do this, you know? And so we're seeing how, you know, people are trying to survive in this world and doing what they can, but they're, they're also being used as part of, like, the greater machine to do this work, that they, they had to occupy this land for... In, out of the interest of the settler colonial idea of like moving westward. Um, so this was part of the westward expansion. Um, many European descendants too were, you know, did, <laughs> the, the name that people were, were given, like when folks went to Oklahoma, then tried to go to California when they tried to escape the Dust Bowl. Um, do you know what people like called these folks that were moving? Okies, hobos, you know, like this, these derogatory names were given to people that were just, were trying to, to sur survive and live, you know. Um, 
So this is another impact of kind of this idea. This is a little more recent. Um, I don't know what this is. But here, the Bracero program, the H2 Bracero, or the H2 program. Um, so today, over 70% of the folks that are growing food um, are born outside of this country. So the Bracero program set up kind of the um, H2A workers, the folks coming in as migrant workers coming in to grow the food in this country. So again, we, we have a food system that employs um, people, and many of these people are, are not, you know, it, m migrant workers and, and agricultural workers have not um, for a very long time been under the same protections as other workers. The, f the food that is being grown in, in many of the large farms is being grown by folks outside of this country and that are not facing really good conditions. There's also it's upwards of 30,000 people um, that are incarcerated that are growing food. About 30,000 people are estimated, uh, 30,000 incarcerated people are estimated are working on farms growing food. Child slavery evolved into sharecropping, evolved into convict leasing. Um, over the course of these times, and convict leasing was this practice. There's a couple ways to think about it, too. I, I work in Sing Sing Prison um, in New York, and I, I meet folks every time I'm there who are cutting the grass um, or cooking in, the, in the, the mess hall or doing some kind of work. Um, they're getting paid less than a dollar a day, you know, like 15 cents um, an hour. and But they're doing this work, so they're for the prison, that the prison could and would otherwise be contracting out for and, and paying somebody a living wage because they have to, but they don't have to because people who are incarcerated, just like agriculture and domestic workers, do not, are not protected by the same labor laws um, as folks who are not incarcerated. So not only is the exploitation of labor happening, but also the prison system is saving so much money by not paying a living wage for the work that has to be done. And I think seeing how these these are all connected though, like this is a talk about the food system. The food system is not separate from the prison and so-called justice system. Um, the majority of people that are incarcerated are, are poor. That is a, a, a fact. That poverty is uh, has a positive relation to incarceration. And the source of poverty is essentially landlessness. If one has land, if one has self-determination and sovereignty on land, poverty doesn't really exist. If you can feed yourself, if you can have a home, if you can bury your, have you know, ceremony, like you have everything that you need, your self-reliance. The taking of land and the systematic theft of land has been a creation of poverty. And then the prison system becomes this one way that we deal with those people who we've dispossessed of land in the first place. So what happens to the indigenous folks or the, the descendants of those that have been enslaved who, still, who the country still doesn't want to have power? We've got to find other places for them. Prison is one of the places. Um, and then other abuses like alcohol and, and premature death is another for many people. But this is the last one, I think. This this is um, two things, but does anybody know what this is a picture of? Yeah. So home ownership is one of like the biggest ways to build wealth in this country these days, home and land ownership. And through ways of redlining, that has been systematically um, declined to many numbers of people, mostly black, indigenous, and folks of color, and poor folks. So um, that's another deep illustration of the systemic way that oppression is continuing to happen. And this is not an old thing. Like, this is where Susan and I live. You know, you can walk two feet and be in completely different socioeconomic spaces and feel that. And, and like, that's the impacts of this redlining. Well, it's also how we move forward. You've got to see it so we know where to, where to go. Um, this is a picture of the 
uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, Pigford versus Glickman. Um, this is when a group of African American farmers um, sued the USDA for um, systemic racism, for, for uh, racial discrimination within land. Um, so between, let's see, in, sorry, I don't memorize, in 1910, um, so during Reconstruction, 16 million acres of farmland, which was the 14% of the total land, was, was owned by black farmers in 1910, so 14%. Now it's less than 1% um, of farms uh, is, are owned by, by black farmers. Um, so uh, I think that shows that there's something that's happened in these 100 years um, from Reconstruction, the height of black ownership of land, to now where it's less than 1% of land is owned by black farmers has been part of many, many reasons, beginning with the violent and terror campaigns of the Jim Crow era, which pushed millions of people northward and off of land. Um, the, and then syst more syst systematic government influenced things like the USDA not giving loans um, to black farmers, taking land from black farmers, um, is, is another way that we've gotten to this place where 98% of the land today is owned by, is in white hands. Um, and the majority of the labor being done is done by people of color. Um, Pigford versus Glickman, though, was one of the many um, movements and resistances and um, right, you know, kind of up, upbringings of kind of like bringing liberation movements into the food system. Um, they won the case. It was the largest civil action case lawsuit. One point six billion dollars, I think, was. Um, redistributed back to um, confluence of black farmers. Um, but it's an illustration of how the government has also been complicit in um, the taking of land and consolidation of land. This is just another really just fascinating thing. I don't know if anybody's seen this. Um, Dr. August Dunning, um, and I can get you information on it. But this is just showing that over 120 years, um, how the foodborne minerals within soil, within food, phosphorus, um, followed these, have gone down um, as the mechanization of agriculture has been influenced. So starting around 1930 with mechanization and then moving through the Great War, uh, World War II, and the introduction of um, synthetic fertilizers, how that's correlated to a drop in mineral minerals which correlates the mineral density and thus nutrition of food, I would say, and the uprising of human-related, um, diet-related diseases. Uh, this was the first time that I ever saw kind of this correlation showing how the influences of mechanization um, and industrialization into agriculture has influenced the human system and also the land and the soil. So with all this in mind, can we say that the food system is broken? It's a picture of World War II and the use of mustard gas. That's today. So is the food system, is it broken or has it been broken from the beginning? Yeah, there's a lot to do, a lot to undo. Come, like just knowing a little bit about the history and recognizing that Think from the very beginning, things haven't been all that great, you know. Um, and so, if we're envisioning what a what a what a food system that meets the needs of all people can look like, like how do we get that? Because we we do have to almost like imagine what that can look like on this continent, because it hasn't existed at, in this country. Um, this country was like it it disposed of that that reality, that world very early on of what a system that was growing food in a more harmonious and biological and ecological way was. And so as a country, we haven't really seen what a food system that meets the needs of all people can look like, right? I mean, there's been a lot that's happened. And so how do we envision that? And how do we build that system? And that's where the question and, and conversation around equity 
I think comes in. So equity, I just found this yesterday. So equity is not equality, is not inclusivity. Um, inclusivity to me, I, I was taught like this analogy that it's like that everyone is at the table, right? That equality, that everyone in inclusivity, that you know, our table is multiracial, multi-class, you know, multi-gender, like that everybody's at the table. But then equity gets into how is power held at that table between people. So equity is about power. Equity is about getting to that systemic, that, that level of how do we change institutions and change systems so that all people have equal power and what has to be done so that we can all share power, so that we can all collectively envision what a world without harm can look like. So equality is that we're all standing on boxes, right? We're all there at the game. Equity, the little guy, little gal, little person, can't see anything, you know? So they're equal, they all have the same box, but, you know, there's obviously a, still a disadvantage. And that's something that is still seen today, you know? We have, I think the civil rights, people, like often civil rights movement today can, can be like, that was the end of racism. Like with the civil rights movement, that, you know, that ended racism in this country. Everybody now has the equal platform. Everybody can vote, right? Everybody can own land. Everybody can have these, these equal rights. But that's not the reality. You know, folks of color, black folks, women, are still, like, still can't vote. Like, we're still seeing that today, voter fraud. Like, there's still, like, this, this thing that is in the way from people realizing their citizenship and rights, their human rights and their civil rights in this country. Um, so equality, it's not that we all have the same rights. It's that, the, that those rights are still, that it's actually enacted and seen that everybody can fulfill these these human rights and these civil rights that we've put in. So equity is about power. Equity is about the redistribution um, of that power relationship. And the reality today is that some people have way more. I'm way over time. I was going to do a privilege walk, which is an advantage walk, but that might be like a whole workshop unto itself for next year, maybe. Um, but a privilege walk is, is a really effective exercise to kind of realize um, our own in, um, privileges or advantages. Um, intersectionality is, can, is a term that is kind of given to like the way that these identities and, and ways of living and being in the world overlay and inter interact and intersect. An example of this is it's much easier to be a man in a, in a male supremacist society than it is to be a woman. Um, it's a lot harder to be a woman of color in a racial, racialized like, system. It's even harder to be a poor woman, poor trans woman of color. So I, a white male, cisgendered person of class privilege, I have like the ultimate advantage in this country. And so a privilege walk is kind of like a way of going through how that actually performs in society in the world. It's a way of us all kind of being able to recognize the different ways that we do privilege from certain things, but we might be having a step back, disadvantages and ad advantages. So I think like that, that's going to be for another time, um, but it does influence like realizing what we each have kind of advantage towards or disadvantage shows that how we can kind of support each other in building more of a collective communal solidarity system. But I want to talk a little bit about how, in some ways, that I, I'm just feeling how we can start to build equity in the BFA, in the regenerative food movement, in the land justice movement, um, just some ideas of how we can do that. So when we go home, there are things that we can do that this isn't something that we just talk about here and then leave, but that we can actually use this history, use this understanding of where we've come from to help us influence how we can move forward. I've been organizing in racial justice, multi, multi-racial, multi-class spaces for a little while, and um, one of the principles that I've really come to be told and called out on and called in on is that 
how and the direction of the movement of the movement for liberation for of black indigenous and folks of color is not one that is led by white people that my job as a white person is to listen to those that are doing the work on the frontline communities of those communities that are most impacted by racism and sexism and classism and then what i can do is to listen and organize and follow but then also to do the dismantling work of my own internalized supremacy culture and do that work with other white folks who have benefited from it. Leverage what we have, what we have been given through these advantages and move that towards the, the direct needs and asks of those that are most impacted doing the work. And so this is, these are a few things that are, that are happening right now around land. And again, land being the foundation of wealth, the foundation of power. So the first thing that was done in this country was take the power, the wealth, the land away from indigenous people. And so we need to repatriate, rematriate that land, um, return that land, return that source of, uh, of self-reliance and self-determination back to those who it was taken from. It's not that simple. I mean, it's <laughs> very complex how land and land ownership and everything works, but it's the idea that knowing that land is the foundation of life and that in order to have life and, and to grow, we all need land. So these are a few things that are happening right now in this moment. Manhattan Fund is uh, um, a group that I'm a part of in New York on the Nape land, uh, raising money for the American Indian Community House, which is one of the largest um, indigenous hubs <coughs> in, in the country. Uh, it's on the Nape land, it's in New York City, but it's really a, a resource community support base for the 100,000 plus um, indigenous people that call um, in this, in this today, call the tri-state area home. Um, so it, A I A A I C H American Indian Community House. Um, so the men had a fund is a group of settler descendants, European descendants, white folks that are doing kind of grassroots fundraising for the American Indian Community House. Everything goes directly to the American Commu Indian Community House. It is all determined. What happens with that money is completely determined by AICH. What the white folks are doing, what the settler, settler descendants are doing, is leveraging our access to networks, to people, to family, to money, to all of the things that have been um, advantaged to us and directing that right to the fund, which is supporting indigenous folks. Real Rent, Real Rent Duwamish is on Duwamish land in so-called Washington State. Basically folks that are living, renting uh, on what, what is Duwamish land, white folks, anybody can pay a rent, can pay a land tax um, or, or rent to the, the Duwamish tribe. So people who are right now paying a landlord can you know, also pay rent to whose land it is on. So this is a way that the, the Duwamish are being compensated f in a way for the land that has been taken from them. And again, it is all determined by the Duwamish people. The organizing, the groundwork, the website development, all of that stuff is done by white folks. Um, so the, the legwork and then and it's, it goes to the Duwamish. Um, Segurite Land Trust is in so-called Bay Area of California. And again, it is a land trust that is women-led, indigenous-led, putting tr land back in trust to the Olon people of, um, of, that, of the Bay Area. And um, they have a, it is called the Shumi land tax. So by committing to a yearly contribution based on the amount of real estate one owns or the amount of rent that one pays in housing goes into the Shumi land tax. And the Shumi land tax goes to the Olon people. These are just a, a couple. I just want, I wanted to give a few ideas of what this can look like. Building equity, building, um, redistributing power, you know, building a more kind of just and equitable system. I think in this day where we have such immense um, stuff with, with the climate chaos and everything, that, that the, the wisdom of an alternative to what is creating climate disorder the wisdom is held in, in traditional cultures, is held in indigenous cultures. And so the more that indigenous folks are on land, are the stewards of land, have, you know, and the less that, like the, the concentration is in 
the dominant culture, that is a shift to how we can start to address some of the, the climate change issues. That knowledge is held, has been for, for centuries in indigenous communities. And so this is all part of like giving that land back so that there is this foundation of survival for, so that the land, the people can heal and the earth can heal. And what I want to end with is reparations and the reparations map for black and indigenous farmers. Has anybody heard of this map? So, so uh, a year and a half ago, Soul Fire Farm, which is a farm in Grafton, New York, it's led by um, black, indigenous, and queer folks. It's really centered around land justice and dismantling racism in the food system. It's an amazing farm, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And they built this map. So I'll show you what that map looks like. Reparations is a big talk, and we can have, like, a, a, I, I would like to have, like, a, a, a bigger conversation about, about reparations because there is, in this moment, a, a huge movement towards reparations. Um, and, again, reparations is not something for me to determine what that looks like. It is something that is, has, is determined by those that have been most impacted by the history of anti-black racism and land theft in this country. And I'll just give a, a brief uh, definition by the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, just so that we have a little foundational definition. But um, they define it as a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. Those groups that have been injured have the right to obtain from the government, corporation, institution, or family responsible for the injuries that which they need to repair and heal themselves. In addition to being a demand for justice, it is a principle of international human rights law. The reparations is not just about money. It's not about a check being written. This is something that people have been talking about for a long time, but that, you know, it's a very comp complex way, and sometimes a check, sometimes money might be the right way, but it's not the only way. And I think a lot of times people, especially folks of European descent and folks with class privilege, get a little off, you know, get a little nervous about the reparations conversation because they think, like, it's like, well, I'm not going to, I didn't have anything to do with enslavement of people, so why should I give my money to folks of African descent in this moment? And it's, it's, not, it's not about that, you know. It's like, it's also recognizing that slavery didn't end in 1865 that the impacts of 250 years of chattel slavery and then 100 years of sharecropping and Jim Crow and 50 years of housing discrimination, that these things, that it, it didn't end, that it's still continuing, and that we're not paying to fix something that happened a long time ago. Yes, we need to be very honest and have that open conversation about the harms that have been committed against people but that there is something that can be done right now to do that repair work and to transform for tomorrow. And so reparations is, is a framework for transformation. Um, it is a framework to say that what can't be done, what can't be done today can be done tomorrow. So reparations is towards that transformation. I had, uh, so this is, this is something that was put together by some friends of ours. Um, Abel Dresdale is a, wrote a social permaculture, beautiful book. Um, Regenerative Design for Change Makers, Abridge Esdale. And this is a, um, a, a diagram that was put together by Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landois. Um, but this is around kind of assessing one's project. So from a social permaculture aspect, like visioning like if, some, if we're going to build a food forest, there's, a, there's something that we need to do before we enter into that project on allocating the, what we have access to, what we need support with. So it's kind of like a, a, an analysis of what, um, like where our strengths are, where our assets are that we can put towards this project. Abra and I have been talking about how do we translate this into supporting a project for reparations. So part of what I wanted to do with the privilege walk was to go through, recognize our different assets. So one way to do this, um, thinking about what we have, what we all have, what we've been given, what we've been leveraged towards through um, kind of our upbringing. I think about this for myself. Um, th I think, you know, this helps me to think about them as things, resources that I can share 
in support of black, indigenous, and folks of color movements towards their liberation, towards liberation of all people, but towards the movements that are led by folks on the front lines, that there are things that I can do to support that. This exercise um, is kind of a going through of what are those different things that we can. So getting away from just money, because money as reparations, that re reparations are resource-based, so it's class. It's about class. And if we don't have a conversation broadly about how white supremacy has, has influenced and supported, advantaged white people, um, many classes of white people, many genders of white people, but there are certain advantages that are given to white people that can then be leveraged to support black-led movements and indigenous-led movements, um, money is not the one thing. Like There are many, many people that are white that do not have class advantage, that do not have money, that are still poor and working class. So it cannot be just about money, but we have to think about the other ways that maybe we have benefited for, for being white in a white supremacist society, culture. So there are networks, there are things that, you know, white people have from the very beginning the, have been able to vote, have been able to own land. Um, what are some of the ways that we can like, like analyze and think about what we have been afforded and then how can we use those things that we've been afforded to support um, a, a movement for reparations or a movement for liberation. So these, and I can share all of these. Uh, maybe if anybody's interested, you can just stay after and I can take your email and email um, you. But these are a few of the asset ways of thinking about what we have. Um, so facilitation skills, um, knowing how to swim, different things that can be leveraged for helping support someone else's, um, or helping to support a group or movement. Um, what I wanted to do is kind of go through this and then look at um, the, uh, a one project on the reparations map. Um, just so that we can think about how, once we do that analysis and asset mapping, um, what, what do we do with it? And having a project in mind, I'll just read one of the projects. So one of the projects is close to here. Um, so this is a, you can see, it's a map that uses like the same platform as Google Maps. Um, there's points on the map that are certain projects um, that are led by folks of color or indigenous folks that have gone through Soul Fire Farm and the Northeast Farmers of Color Network trainings. So these are all projects. And basically, pick, you can, you know, if you click on one of the projects, on one of the bubbles, so right closest to us where we are is this one right now. So uh, gardening the community, I'll just read the, the needs. And so my, yeah, I'll read the needs first. So $1,500 to work develop a plan for two adjacent pieces of property near a Walnut Street farm stand greenhouse to further our production and composting capability. This plan will then be presented to the city with the goal of purchasing the parcels and growing more food. Another need is money for general operating costs and a funding to facilitate further exchanges for our youth and other organizations around the country. There's also a description of the, of the project. So this is a youth-led project in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, so the, the needs are $1,500 um, for a property near Walnut Street, and then um, for the, the production composting. And then, so this is one thing that, once we know the project, once we know the needs of what is, what is needed, using the asset mapping, then we can say, okay, I have, even if I don't have access to $1,500, through my networks that I have been able to become a part of, there's a way that I can help to facilitate um, a fundraising for $1,500 that can go to this group. Or other, other places, there's a, a need for technical assistance. So if you know how to use tractors, if you know how to um, you know, amend soil, do, do these different things. Like that's what, what can be leveraged to help a certain project get off its feet. And again, like this is grounded in land. That's why this reparations map is really transformative and is that it is interpersonal, it is between people, it is building this relationship and it's supporting the, the, um, 
the self-determination and sovereignty of people who have been marginalized and disenfranchised from land to become back on land and have their own uh, way in self-determination on land. So it's, it's really centering land in, in this conversation reparations, but that land is the foundation of wealth, of power, that that is how we can start to transform and build equity in the movement is how um, we can support all people kind of getting that, that freedom and that real life resource. Um, I think that's all I had, and I think it's time. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, yeah. <laughs>